everybody. So this week I did some work with the soldering iron on a number of systems. I worked on mostly atom boards, but I did work on a ColecoVision board too. I did a lot of RAM replacement. I had one ColecoVision board, I removed all the RAM, I replaced it with new RAM, made it work again, yay! Um, and the atom boards, because I only had the one atom that runs the BBS and I needed to back up Adam just in case and something I could use too. So I bought some dead boards from a person up in New York, a really nice guy named Phil. And the two top boards, if you don't know anything about the Adams, the Adam have a bottom board that's the Adam and the top board is called the game board, which is basically just a Cleco vision, slightly different. Um, the two top boards I had to replace the video ram on those so that you would get some video. And one atom bottom board worked great, and the other atom bottom board I had to replace all the RAM on it, and it works good too. Though I suspect there may be a problem with the 6801 that runs the tape drive. But anyways, I'm going to show you, I'm going to do a quick fast thing, and I'll do a voiceover to explain it. But I want to show you how to easily, well not easily, well it is easy but it's time consuming remove all the video chips off of a board and then remove all the solder off the board and then put in some sockets and replace the chips and make it all work without having to go out and buy a desoldering station or spend a lot of money on it this is i mean i do have a desoldering iron but i paid like 15 20 bucks for that from amazon so it's not that expensive um, but this is a very good way, and if you follow the method that I explain in here, you can do it without destroying any of those really thin traces that Coleco used. So, hope you enjoy this. So, the first thing we need to do to replace the RAM on this Atom board is we have to remove the old chips. Now, the normal way most people would do it is they would have a desoldering station, and they would remove the solder from the back, and then use a wire wick or a copper wick or solder wick whatever you want to call it to try to remove most of the traces of the solder and then work the chip out and though this does work you can end up ripping the traces off i have done it many a time so this method that i figured out works very well i mean i didn't come up with it other people have done it too i got these little nippers that actually came with my 3d printer and i use it to clip all the pins off of the ram chips Then once I remove the chips, I just have the pins sticking there. Then I brace the board up in a vise, which is actually just a very heavy and giant C-clamp, because why not? It works. And I will take the soldering iron, and on the back side, I will heat up the pin. And once the pin starts to move, and only once it starts to move, then I will grab it with the nippers and pull it out. Don't put the nippers on before it gets hot because you're cooling the pin off and you end up ripping traces. Learn the hard way. Wait till it starts to flop around on its own that all that solder is nice and liquid then pull it out. Then go to the next one then the next one. And since there's eight chips with 16 pins on it that is 128 pins you're gonna pull out. Occasionally, you'll get a pin that doesn't want to liquefy, or solder that doesn't want to liquefy. In that case, you actually have to add more solder to the back so that there's enough solder there to transfer the heat through the pinhole to the actual pin.
Once all the pins have been removed, then you flip the board over and you take your soldering iron and your solder and counterintuitive to what you would believe, you actually add solder back on the pinholes. Again, the reason for this is the solder conducts the heat into the pinhole. And I'm going to use a desoldering iron to suck that out. And if there's not enough solder to conduct the heat, nothing will come out. Once we've added solder back to the pads, then we take the desoldering iron. The desoldering iron really is just a vacuum tube. What happens is you put the soldering iron on the pad, it warms the solder back up, makes it liquid again, and then you push the button and it attempts to suck all the solder up out of the hole. It's about 75% effective. Um, it takes a while to get used to how to do it right. and As you'll see, I don't get every one of them out and there is another way of doing it after removing most of the solder and you'll get to see how that works too. Sometimes you end up having to add more solder on the pad that won't come out to see if you can get it out. Now that I've used the solder sucker to remove most of the solder, I put the board back in the vise, and I get a little pin. This is actually an axle from an Atom data drive, the encoder wheel. It's a perfect size, solder has a very hard time sticking to it. And what I do is I put the soldering iron on the back of the board on the hole to heat the solder up that's still in there so it bubbles. Then I take that little pin and I shove it through the hole and pull it out the outside. And that actually clears out the hole. And it works really well too. I'll work my way through the board, looking through each hole, finding the next hole that has some solder in the way. And do the same, just keep cleaning them out like this until all the holes are basically emptied out of solder. You'll later see that sometimes I don't get it all, but there is a way around that too. Once all the holes are cleared out, I flip it back over and I take a socket and I put an old chip in it, just one that I have, I mean it fits in it, and just this to hold the pins in place in the socket because they can come out. So I push that pin chip in there. Then I put it into the board, into the holes. Make sure that the notch on the socket lines up with the notch on the, or the writing on the board and I push it into the holes.
Once I push it into the holes, I flip the board over and then using the soldering iron, I tack it into place and then add more solder to solder all the pins in place. If there is too much resistance pushing it into the board, I stop, remove it, take the pin and clean it out some more. If they all go in but one pin pushes out a little bit, that's fine because what you end up doing is, and I'll show this later somewhere, you end up soldering all the pins in place, removing the chip out of the socket, then put the board back up in the vise, take your fingernail, put it on the pin that's sticking out a little in the socket, heat up the hole on the other side and just push it through the rest of the way because there's a little bit of solder that was resisting it. It works great. Now here's a socket where the pin didn't go all the way through. So as I said, I put it in the vise, put my fingernail on the, so on the pin that didn't go through, the little edge that's sticking up, the spring or whatever you want to call it, the contact, and then heat up the other side and just push it through until it seats. Now that all the sockets are in, I'm going to test to make sure that all the traces work. This is actually really easy to do if you have a continuity tester or even just a multimeter will work too. What you're going to do is you're going to be testing that certain pins work. Now as you see in the little diagram up on the top left hand corner, it shows you the pinouts for the 4164 pin chip. Some of these carry on from each chip is exactly the same. So if you touch pin one on any of those eight sockets, it should carry from each socket over. If you don't get a signal, then that socket is not part is not connected somewhere. You got a broken trace. Same goes for pin three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then on the other side, sixteen 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, and 9. The only pins that don't transfer, that aren't connected to each socket is pin 2, the data in, and pin 14, the data out. Those are individual lines that go to the CPU. And those you can test by, if you look on the back and you chase the you, tra you chase the trace, kind of hard to say that, you chase the trace you can check for continuity there. But normally the ones that break are the address pins. Those are the ones I always seem to have issues with. I don't know why. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to test all of these. And then after all the work is done, we give it a test to make sure everything works. And as you can see, it works great. There you can see the replacement chips on the bottom board. And you can also see the replacement chips that I did on the top board. So the saga of the nasty is slowly coming to a conclusion. As you can see, the nasty is back together, sans a few parts. I did not put the RF shields in because I don't believe in them. Um, data drive don't work. It spun once and then stopped. The original keyboard never even lights up. So I can open that up. It's probably got a dead board inside of it or God knows what's in it. But this one does work with it, so it plugs in fine. 
Um, I haven't even actually tried to type. Let's just see. Let's remove this from here. Let's just see. Okay, we are typing. So we are typing, and these spun up, but that's it. So the nasty continues to grow, er, grow, come back to life. I'm going to do some more work on it as time permits. I'm going to pull the keyboard apart and figure out what's wrong with it. I debated cleaning it and I decided, you know what? I kind of like it messy. So the nasty is going to stay really ugly. So there you go. The nasty. In case you've been wondering what's happening to it.